Greetings. I am Vida Samian and will be moderating the session today. Thank you all for joining us for this timely webinar on US-Iran relations in the Biden era, organized by CASI, Committee of Anti-Imperialists in Solidarity with Iran. CASI is an organization that opposes US imperialism against Iran and is united against US intervention in Iran, Iraq, and throughout the world. We're a group of internationalist activists who support the right of people and nations to build their own societies free from the terror of imperialist war and violence. Today, we have three speakers followed by a joint question and answer session coordinated by Helia Dutagi. Please use chat to write your questions during the presentations. Now to our panel. The 1979 political revolution in Iran ended 25 years of US imperialist domination and the rule of its despotic monarch, the Shah. The massive participation of Iranians in the revolution called for independence from US imperialist domination, which was delivered from the start. The result of this great sin of independence has been over 40 years of crippling sanctions and wars imposed by successive US governments to paralyze the Iranian economy and create the conditions for a regime change. Today's panel brings a distinguished group of speakers to address this history, the impact of the last 40 years on Iran and what we can expect during the Biden presidency. Our first panelist, Richard Anderson Falk, is Milibank Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University and currently holds the Chair of Global Law at Queen Mary University, London. A graduate of Harvard University and Yale Law School, Richard Falk has published over 50 books and numerous articles, including, just to name a few, Vietnam War and International Law, Palestine, The Legitimacy of Hope, The Declining World Order, America's Imperial Geopolitics, Crimes of War, Iraq, Predatory Globalization, a Critique. He is a public intellectual who has been an inspiration and a guide to many of us with his relentless stance for social justice globally and for his advocacy for Palestinian rights, in particular while serving as UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Occupied Palestine between 2008 and 2014. What is perhaps less known is that Professor Falk has followed closely the events in Iran <clears throat> and has many articles and interviews on the subject. In 1979, along with Ramsey Clark, he visited Iran and then returned after the revolution in 1980. This is reflected in his political memoirs entitled Public Intellectual, The Life of a Citizen Pilgrim, scheduled to be released on this very day, February 1st, 2021. Today, he will be speaking on continuity or discontinuity, Iran as Biden's first major foreign policy test. Welcome, Professor Falk. Thanks so much, Vida. It's very good to be part of this panel, and I look forward to the discussion that we have. Uh, Iran is probably the most confusing foreign policy issue on the Biden agenda at the moment. Uh, and I think the reasons for that are the contradictory pulls that uh, relate to Iran in a way that isn't so uh, visible in relation to other issues. For one thing, Iran poses an opportunity to clearly show uh, the American people particularly, but Europeans also, that there's a great difference between Trump's foreign policy 
and the foreign policy that Biden intends to pursue. And one of the things that the European uh, allies of the US resented was the withdrawal from the nuclear agreement deal reached by the Obama administration in 2015. So there is the incentive to turn a new page in relation to Iran. But at the same time, there are contradictory pulls in the other direction. The main contradictory pull comes not from inside the US, but from Israel that is uh, challenging uh, the intention to revive American participation in this nuclear agreement, which is sort of the litmus test for whether or not there will be a different foreign policy toward Iran uh, by the Biden presidency. And not only has uh, Israel at the highest levels spoken against uh, renewing American participation in the agreement, but it's the head of the Israeli uh, IDF, the Defense Forces, has uh, threatened to take unilateral military action against Iran if indeed this agreement is revived without uh, substantial adjustments. And uh, supposedly, uh, the, in, in fact, publicly, the, this IDF uh, leader has uh, said that uh, Israel is preparing operational plans to strike at uh, Iran's nuclear facilities. So, so you have this uh, problematic situation uh, confronting the, the Biden presidency. On the one side, it wants to have this clear, uh, bright line between its approach and the Trump approach. On the other hand, it doesn't want to anger the uh, strong Zionist uh, lobby within the United States or uh, the Israeli governmental leadership. And it doesn't want to do that for two reasons. The obvious one of not alienating an important part of its supposed political base. But beyond that, uh, the Biden presidency depends largely on focusing on the domestic uh, policy agenda, both the uh, COVID uh, health crisis and the economic uh, recovery agenda. And uh, to do that in any kind of effective way uh, will pre presuppose that there are no major distractions. Uh, and in that sense, uh, aside from the substance, uh, the Biden presidency is interested in a smooth transition uh, to a post-Trump uh, approach to Iran. And so far, and this follows, I think, from my assessment that there are these contradictory push and pull forces at work, so far there have been mixed signals. On the one hand, there's the very encouraging appointment of Rob Malley as the chief negotiator of a return to the agreement. And that, that suggests a Obama plus uh, approach uh, to uh, Iran diplomacy. And uh, that, that really is encouraging. Rob Malley has been generally on the Middle East issues uh, during the Obama period, a, a person who took a less dogmatic position uh, throughout the region and seemed to be more sympathetic to the Palestinian struggle and to Palestinian rights, as well as seeking 
uh, to normalize relations with Iran. So that's, that's really a positive development along with the frequently repeated uh, Biden pledge that he wants very much to renew uh, the nuclear agreement. And that that is consistent with uh, giving high priority to the bipartisan uh, affirmation of nonproliferation as a major American foreign policy goal in the region and uh, generally uh, a part of what uh, the United States has been pursuing uh, and in a way that's somewhat disturbing because uh, nonproliferation is used as a pretext to intervene in Iran and there have been frequent uh, interventions through covert action as well as the very uh, visible uh, assassination of uh, General Soleimani and uh, leading nuclear scientists. Uh, there, there have been a number of coercive steps taken in the name of nonproliferation, while there's complete silence about the Israeli nuclear weapons arsenal. In fact, it's rather remarkable that Iran has refrained from saying, we will forego uh, the nuclear weapons option if Israel joins in establishing a nuclear free zone throughout the Middle East, which would be beneficial economically and in terms of bringing stability to the whole region and would be a great triumph for the non-proliferation agenda, if that was really what was involved. Uh, so that there's a, a, a lot at stake in how this issue becomes resolved by the Biden uh, presidency. And there's also a question of how Iran approaches this renewal of post-Trump relations with the US. Uh, will it uh, make it easy for the Biden presidency uh, by uh, agreeing to uh, not only resume the nuclear agreement, but saying that it will uh, go back to this, the guidelines that were in the agreement and will uh, either destroy or not further enrich uh, uranium. It's been enriching uranium to 20%, whereas the agreement limited uh, the enrichment to 3%. And this is one of the objections that Israel and opponents of the uh, of a, a more forthcoming approach to Iran uh, emphasize that, in other words, withdraw, Trump's withdrawal from the agreement and Iran's behavior after the withdrawal has put uh, Iran closer to uh, having a nuclear weapons option. And uh, Tony Blinken, the uh, new American Secretary of State, has made it very clear that uh, the US position is not one that won't impose conditions on Iran. And he couples uh, that uh, kind of harder line uh, with uh, a demand that Iran shows its good faith uh, by accepting these conditions as a uh, preliminary step before the renewal of negotiations. President Rouhani, on the other hand, has taken the opposite position of saying the U.S. must eliminate the sanctions first if it wants to uh, enter into negotiations 
uh, with the United States about the nuclear agreement. And Iran has a strong uh, case. Uh, the US withdrawal was over the objection of the other five uh, members of the agreement, the other five signatories, which included uh, the four other permanent members of the Security Council, plus Germany. And it also um, uh, was punished by uh, intensified sanctions during the Trump presidency for doing nothing uh, wrong. And it should be clear, I think, to people that the Iranian position, as I understand it, is one of not seeking a nuclear weapons option, in fact, repudiating the idea of acquiring nuclear weapons uh, unconditionally. And if I'm correct about this, uh, the Supreme Guide uh, Khamenei has issued a fatwa confirming the rejection of nuclear weapons as a permissible step for Iran to take under any conditions. Now, this may not be a position shared uh, throughout the Iranian uh, leadership, and uh, one doesn't know how seriously to take it. But I think what is serious is that one should not look at this U.S.-Iran relationship just from Washington's perspective. It's necessary also to see the degree to which uh, Iran has been victimized by political assassination of its most revered uh, military leader who was a popular political figure as well. Uh, it has suffered from the sanctions uh, during the COVID crisis when the WHO and uh, many other international institutions uh, pleaded with the international community to suspend the sanctions uh, during the uh, period while the pandemic persisted. So that Iran has uh, very substantial grievances and for the US to impose preconditions uh, is, it seems to me, a very uh, dubious path to pursue. Another consideration is that if the uh, deal reached to get Iran and back into the agreement and to have some promise of de-escalating sanctions is too unfavorable to Iran, it may influence the June presidential elections in Iran and produce a uh, leadership that doesn't want to be as restricted as the uh, agreement plus some external issues that could be brought into the negotiations. Iran has been very much attacked by uh, the new Secretary of State here and by uh, other mainstream Democrats because of its involvement throughout the region, its relationship with Hezbollah in Lebanon, its relationship to Hamas in Gaza, and its relationship to the Houthis in Yemen have been particular uh, flashpoints for the kind of Israel-American Saudi uh, policies in the region. So there, there is a, a really important um, question because if, if the, the US negotiating position with Iran to get uh, to end the sanctions by stages uh, brings in the, these kind of issues and possibly the issue of Iran's missile capabilities, which arguably have been enhanced 
uh, since the Trump withdrawal from the agreement, uh, the, uh, supposedly the guidance systems are more precise and the range is longer and the number of missiles is greater. And hardline uh, US uh, foreign policy uh, advocates are saying that those issues should be included if one really wants to achieve uh, stability in the region. And this, this is again quite an unreasonable set of demands given the fact that the US is heavily intervening in Yemen on the anti-Houthi side, that it's been active in uh, supporting Israel's repression of the Palestinian uh, people. And throughout the region, it has supported uh, repressive uh, anti-Islamic uh, kinds of governing uh, positions, including in, in Egypt, most importantly. So that when we think about how this uh, relationship can evolve, we can think of how it might evolve ideally, which I would say would mean uh, suspending sanctions and advocating not only a renewal of American participation without new conditions in the agreement, but being receptive to uh, the, a proposal for a nuclear free zone throughout the Middle East. Of course, this will is unrealistic because Israel will absolutely refuse and it will create a real crisis in US Israel relations. So the more realistic uh, prospect is for some kind of compromise between uh, saying Iran must uh, give up its engagement with Middle East issues, including Syria, uh, and the sanctions will be gradually uh, lifted as Iran shows its good faith, uh, and that the agreement be, will be restored, but Iran will not move in any further direction toward uh, the nuclear threshold. That will create friction, but it's probably manageable uh, if uh, the Biden uh, presidency is willing to uh, encounter a certain amount of resistance in Congress and uh, from the uh, organized uh, Israeli uh, lobby. But I'm not uh, too hopeful that this uh, more realistic scenario, which will be an improvement, but a limited improvement, it will be basically a renewal of the Obama uh, period uh, diplomacy, which seemed to be heading in a uh, desirable direction, though it was commenced uh, much too uh, early and uh, in his president, I mean, much too late in his presidency to allow a normalization process to have uh, deep roots, which I think was a huge mistake. It could have been negotiated three or four years earlier and uh, it would have been much more difficult uh, for the Trump presidency to uh, disrupt it as much as it did do. So I think that there are uh, very big challenges that face the Biden presidency, and those challenges will depend a lot on how it decides to handle its relationship with Israel and the Gulf countries on the one side, how Congress will degree, will agree to a uh, reasonable 
uh, position uh, with respect to the renewal of the agreement and the extent to which uh, Iran uh, doesn't push for a maximal uh, uh, removal of the sanctions prior to agreeing uh, to uh, come back to the agreement in ways that at least provide reassurance about the uh, proliferation angle. Uh, let me conclude by uh, emphasizing uh, the importance of uh, getting Iran uh, straight in the Biden foreign policy, because if it fails in uh, dealing with Iran, uh, the situation throughout the region will become much even much worse than it already is. And it will create a, a new source of tension. In the background, of course, still is this question, if uh, Biden goes ahead and reaches an agreement and restores American participation, ends by stages the sanctions, and then Israel goes ahead and uh, attacks Iran, uh, what will then ensue? I mean, that's the most negative uh, scenario because I think it will lead to a uh, very major war and it would be a disaster for the Biden foreign policy because it would uh, create a distraction from uh, the domestic priorities, it would be unpredictable in its uh, extent and outcome, and it would uh, create uh, enormous tensions with Europe. So I think the Biden people will try very hard not to antagonize uh, Israel to the point where it might ser be seriously tempted to initiate such an attack, which would seem to be contrary to Israel's own uh, national interests. So one does have the reasonable belief that uh, the Israeli leadership is bluffing. It's playing a poker game. It's trying to uh, intimidate the US in a way that makes it push for a better or more harsh bargain if it is to uh, renew its participation in the agreement. So what I'm really uh, trying to express is the importance of uh, working toward Iran-US normalization, the mixed signals so far sent by the Biden presidency and the complexity of these cross-cutting uh, forces that uh, lead to a kind of policy confusion, uh, which probably uh, makes it difficult for Iran to understand what the US position really is uh, because of the uh, receiving these mixed signals. So I have the hope that the Mali appointment is a serious indicator that Biden wants an agreement. But I have the fear that a combination of the Blinken conservatism to in foreign policy combined with Israeli pressures uh, could spoil that prospect. Let me stop there. Look forward to others. Thank you, Professor Falk, and. Um, um, 
to our viewers, we had some problem initially and ended up starting, um, and some of you started joining us. It was a Zoom problem. And the whole webinar will be on East is a podcast, so you can see it there. And of course, it will also be on the site of um, Kasi. So um, we will move to our second speaker, next panelist, Sasan Fayez Manish, is Professor Emeritus of Economics at CSU Fresno. He has a Master of Science in Mathematics from UCLA and a PhD in Economics, specializing in political economy and Marxian economy. An important area of his research has been US-Iran relations, in particular, the US policy of sanctions. He's the author of two volumes on the topic, The United States and Iran, Sanctions, Wars, and the Policy of Dual Containment, 2008, and um, Containing Iran, Obama's Policy of Tough, Di Tough Diplomacy in 2013. Additionally, he has written numerous articles on US-Iran relations in Counterpunch and other venues. He has also been labeled as one of the 101 most dangerous professors by David Horowitz, along with actually Professor Falk and Noam Chomsky and Angela Davis. So it's an honor <laughs> to have that title. Today, he will be tracing the history of sanctions and the policy of containment to provide insight into what we might expect under the Biden presidency. Welcome, Sasan. Okay, um, almost two decades, two decades ago, I presented a paper at an economics conference that was eventually published in 2003 as the politics of US economic sanctions against Iran. The article was uh, about US policy of dual containment, which attempted to overthrow simultaneously the government of Iran as well as Iran. To this day, uh, the article is regularly re read and cited apparently because it is as relevant now as it was then. <clears throat> the 2003 essay eventually led to a two volume book on US-Iran relations from 1979 Iranian revolution to the first term of Obama administration that Vida mentioned. Subsequently, I started to write a third volume on Obama's second term in office, but I never finished this volume, particularly after Donald Trump became the president. Based on my research and writings, let me give you a short history uh, of sanctions against Iran ending with my expectation of things to come under the Biden administration. Containing Iran originally began after the Iranian revolution when a mutually beneficial relation between the Shah of Iran, US and Israel ended. Following uh, the nationalization of some US corporations and subsequent uh, so-called hostage crisis, the Carter administration froze Iranian assets in 1979 but soon after this sanction morphed into the policy of dual containment as the Carter administration gave Saddam Hussein the green light to invade Iran. It was hoped that the war between Iran and Iraq would lead to the resolution of the hostage crisis and the overthrow of the Iranian government. But the US also hoped that down the line, Saddam Hussein will be overthrown as well. The containment policy became overt and intense under the Reagan administration, while the US blatantly supported Saddam Hussein in the war and went even as far as engaging Iran on behest of Hussein. At the same time, he took measures to assure that Hussein is not victorious either, giving false information to both sides and selling arms to Iran, mostly with the help of the Israelis, in the so-called Iran-Contra scandal, where examples of this double role that Reagan administration played in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, I have to add here that by some estimate, 
a million people died in that war. <clears throat> After the war, the US and Israel concentrated primarily on containing Iraq. Following the US invasion of Iraq in 1990 and the temporary containment of Saddam Hussein, once again, Iran became the main target of containment by means of sanctions. And during the Clinton administration, the Israeli lobby groups, particularly American Israeli Public Affairs Committee, as it's known, AIPAC, and its affiliate Washington Institute for Near East Policy, WINET, uh, became the main architects of US foreign policy towards Iran and the underwriters of sanctions. It was in this period that the uh, former head of WINET, whose name is Martin Indyk and is still around, and subsequently the national security advisor to President Clinton claimed to have devised the policy of dual containment. The Israeli lobby group formulated or groups formulated three misbehaviors of Iran, quote and unquote, as the main reasons for containing it. One was Iran's support for international terrorism, which they meant Hezbollah, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad. Second, opposition to Israeli-Palestinian peace process, which was Oslo, and it was disbanded by both uh, US and Israel eventually and the pursuit of weapons of mass destruction, which at that time was actually quite unclear what they mean. The containment of Iran, as well as Iraq, became more intensified with the election of George W. Bush and the takeover of the Middle East policy by the so-called neoconservatives. Individuals affiliated with the Israeli lobby groups, such as Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Perl, both from Winnet, and David Wormser, who was advisor to Cheney, became instrumental in turning the policy of dual containment into the policy of dual rollback, as Wormser called it in his book. Iraq was targeted for invasion, and it was hoped that Iran will be contained thereafter by means of more severe unilateral and multilateral sanctions, and if necessary, military actions by US, Israel, or both. So that threat has existed continuously. Similar to the case of Iraq, the US and Israel use the allegation that Iran is developing weapons of mass destruction as the main reason to impose more severe sanctions and prepare the ground for an eventual military operation. The opportunity came in 2002 when an Iranian exile cult called Mujahideen Khal, which was at the time listed by the US as a terrorist group, and yet working very closely uh, with US and Israel, claimed that Iran is constructing illegally some nuclear facilities. Following these claims, a case was made for reporting Iran to the United Nations Security Council and imposing sanctions. Between 2006 and 2008, three sets of sanction resolutions were passed through the UN Security Council. Toward the end of the second term of the Bush administration, there was a push for the fourth UN sanction. Uh, Israel was also pushing the US to wage an attack on Iran nuclear facilities. Yet the Bush administration was running out of time as the presidential election was approaching. Containment of Iran was left to the next administration. Given the history of containment policy, it wasn't difficult for somebody like me prior to the 2008 presidential election to say that regardless of the outcome, the US foreign policy towards Iran will be determined largely by Israel and its various lobby groups in, in US, which of course I remember in a conference, other people disagreed that Obama is not gonna do that. And this was indeed what happened, at least in the first term of President Obama. Dennis Ross, the former director of UNEP, uh, who is uh, still writing blueprints for the Biden administration, as of last week I read one of them, became Obama's closest advisor to the Middle East and particularly Iran. Obama pursued a tough or aggressive policy, quote unquote, with Iran, as he had declared in his 2007 APEC speech. The, the diplomacy, as UNEP had formulated it, 
was intended to give an ultimatum to Iran in some face-to-face -face meetings, telling Iran to either accept the U.S.-Israeli demands or face aggression. The meetings were also intended to create the impression of engaging Iran so that U.S. could gain inter international support for aggressive actions. With some modifications, Obama's tough policy was a continuation of the previous administration's policies. He indeed maintained some of the same Israeli lobby groups, uh, individuals, I'm say, sorry to say, uh, who had served in the Bush administration, I can name them. Obama followed Ross's policy of aggressive diplomacy as he tried to create the illusion of engaging Iran, but that didn't last too long. By the spring of 2009, while old sanctions were being renewed, Hillary Clinton was talking about imposing what she called tough, crippling sanctions against Iran. Moreover, the Obama administration was working hard to pass the fourth UN sanction uh, on Iran. And they cajoled and bribed Russia and China to, give to gain their necessary votes in the Security Council. The fourth UN sanction passed in 2010 after a few meetings between Iran and the five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, plus Germany, uh, commonly known as P5 plus one that Richard mentioned. This was despite the Iranian government under the previous administration of Ahmadinejad agreeing to major concessions due concerning its nuclear enrichment. After this, the U.S. has started the most massive and unprecedented series of sanctions called crippling, paralyzing, lethal, etc. sanctions imposed on Iran. Among these were the 2010 Congressional Sanction on Iran called CISADA, which was underwritten by APAC. I usually read APAC to figure out what's the nature of the sanction. The act imposed some of the most severe sanctions on Iran since the Clinton years. But what Israel and its lobby groups wanted was sanctioning the Iranian Central Bank or Bank Banke Meli, which would be the heart of the whole, whole financial uh, system in Iran. The US obliged and included this in the National Defense Act of 2012. The new European uh, Union uh, also joined the US in imposing this sanction. In addition to sanctions, there were repeated talks, as Richard mentioned, of possible military attacks on Iran by uh, Israel, US, or both. And for the most part, the threats were used to impose more severe sanctions. <clears throat> by the end of uh, 2010, the policy of top di tough diplomacy had no diplomacy left in it. It was merely a tough policy. The continuation of continuous threats and increasing sanctions affected the Iranian economy. The value of Iran's currency fluctuated widely. GDP rate of growth became negative. Consumer prices rose rapidly. Yet, even though the Iranian economy seemed to face a severe case of what we call the stagflation in economics, it did not collapse and proved to be more resilient than the architects of the policy of top diplomacy had expected. And everything that I'm saying, I checked Obama's last book, uh, A Promised Land. Uh, so far, everything is just about in there as well. The second term of Obama's administration, however, brought about some changes in Iran policy. The reason for these changes, as far as I could see, were primarily the very fact that the policy of top diplomacy had failed to achieve its ultimate goal, uh, the departure of a number of Israeli lobbyists from the administration, such as Dennis Ross. And uh, number three, the replacement of the hawkish, if I may say, so monster, as Samantha Power said, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton by John Kerry, an individual who advocated a more rational policy towards Iran. In 2013, the P5 plus one offered a proposal to the government of Ahmadinejad, which implicitly recognized the right of Iran to enrich uranium for civilian purposes. This was a complete turnaround as far as I could see. However, Ahmadinejad's government dragged its feet and ultimately ran out of time as the Iranian presidential election approached. The new president Rouhani accepted the agreement and pushed it forward. The result was the JCPOA that Richard mentioned. 
which ultimately was implemented in 2016. The agreement resulted in limiting Iran's nuclear activities in return for lifting certain nu nuclear related sanctions, not all of them. Moreover, the agreement resulted in Security Council adopting a new resolution in 2015, which lifted the previous sanction resolutions. Israel and its lobby groups, of course, did everything in their power to stop JCPOA at every step of the way. This included Netanyahu appearing contrary to the wishes of the President of the United States before the joint session of the US Congress in 2015, re receiving a standing ovation to give a speech in opposition to the agreement. It also included the Israeli lobby groups, including APAC, spending millions of dollars on advertising to kill the deal. Indeed, the US Senate nearly derailed the agreement. Even though JCPOA was significant, it did not end the hostilities between Iran and the US since the agreement dealt only with nuclear related sanctions. Other sanctions against Iran, particularly those related to Iran's support for so-called terrorism and violation of human rights remain intact, and the US Congress continued to draft its own sanction uh, bills. Therefore, Obama left office with an uneasy and shaky agreement with Iran over nuclear issues. If the history of US-Iran relation was a tragedy up until now, it became a farce under Donald Trump, a madman who probably had never read a single page of 159 pages of JCPOA. And yet he stated even before taking the office that I'm quoting him, his number one priority is to dismantle the disastrous deal with Iran. The deal is catastrophic for America, for Israel, and for the whole Middle, Middle East. I wish I was Alex Baldwin and I could say it a lot better than, than this. Uh, Trump's promise to dismantle the JCPOA had to wait until the Israeli surrogates, such as John Bolton, Mike Pompeo, Nikki Haley were all in place. These elements uh, were being advised by some of the most deranged and dangerous lobby groups in the US. One, one of them is the so-called Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, FTD. Uh, FTD was formed in 2001 by Israeli lobbyists, and I'm quoting to provide education to enhance Israel's image in the United States in North America, I'm sorry. But the organization's sole purpose became regime change in Iran. John Bolton brought one of the FDD's senior advisor, Richard Goldberg, to serve in the National Security Council. The new gang in the White House has started what came to be known as the maximum pressure campaign against Iran. In 2018, the US officially withdrew from JCPOA. Not only the old sanctions were restored, but many new ones were added almost on a weekly basis, as I was reading them. This was sanctioning Iran uh, on steroids, as, as one uh, AP news title was. For example, elements at the highest level of the Iranian government, such as the so-called Supreme Leader, Foreign Minister, and uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard were all sanctions. And the last one uh, was actually designated as a terrorist organization. Needless to say that the Europeans did nothing but talk about preserving JCPOA. Iran subsequently started to review some of its commitment under JCPOA. Maximum pressure also meant threatening Iran and with military attacks and creating the conditions for armed conflict. This included flying drones close to or over Iran, uh, one of which was shut down by Iran in June of 2019. It also included tanker skirmishes in the Persian Gulf, including chasing an Iranian tanker, which I wrote about for Counterpunch. The military campaign reached its boiling point when the US murdered Iranian General Ghassem Soleimani that Richard mentioned in 2020. Iran then retaliated by bombing US bases in Iraq and Kurdistan five days later. After that, this, after that, skirmishes between the two countries lessened 
the White House gang then concentrated on bringing back UN sanctions. They argued that according to the UN resolution, uh, 2231, they are still a participant in the JCPOA and therefore they can invoke the trigger mechanism to snap back, snap back the multilateral sanctions. The argument was so bizarre that nobody on the US, UN Security Council except for Dominican Republic bought it. The Trump gang was left with leading sanctions after sanctions on Iran, sometimes sanctioning the same individuals and the firms that had been sanctioned before. These sanctions, of course, made life very difficult in Iran, particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic hitting Iran very early and severely. Iran's economy, which had shown some positive rates of growth following the JCPOA, fell back into negative territory. Unemployment rose. Uh, real plummeted and inflation increased. But once again, the American presidency, uh, an American presidency came to an end and there was no regime change in Iran. The burning question, of course, as Richard talked about, is uh, what can we expect from the Biden administration? And I think the answer lies in the history that I laid out. For more than four decades, the US and Israel the two, two colonial entities with a long and mutually beneficial relations have opposed Iran. Israel, I, th I think, uh, because it feels that the major obstacle to its greater Israel dream is Iran, and US primarily because it can't stand an independent and non-subservient country. To this mixture, one should add the European countries and the Arab states. As long as these actors and their relations remain intact, it is hard to expect any change in US foreign policy towards Iran. Specifically, and I'm ending, Biden is the same fellow who said in 2015 in front of Israel, uh, Israeli groups, where there no Israel, I'm quoting you, where there no Israel, America would have to invent one. We have to invent one because Ron, Israeli ambassador to the US, Ron is right. You protect our interests like we protect yours. End of quote. Biden also is the same fellow who said in 2020 interview with Thomas Friedman, and I'm quoting him, in consultation with our allies and partners, we are going to engage in negotiations and follow on agreements to tighten and lengthen Iran's nuclear constraints, as well as address missiles program. Similar statements have been made more pessimistic by Biden's associates, such as Secretary of State Blinken and, to, and, um, and uh, National Security Advisor uh, Jake uh, Sullivan, as well as the EU three uh, representatives. What does it mean? It means trying to renegotiate JCPOA, as they call it now, JCPOA plus and break down Iran's defensive capabilities, something that the Trump gang tried to do. The major difference is in form, not in content. Um, the Biden gang, uh, I'm sorry, the Trump gang uh, consisted of a bunch of incompetent hooligans, as far as I'm concerned, who tried to defang Iran without the help of the Europeans. The Biden gang will be competent gentlemen who will work very hard with the EU3 and together they will find, to use Biden's words, again quoting him, a smarter way to be tough on Iran. The result will be more or less the same. Four more years of skirmishes between Iran, the US and Israel. So let me end it here and then maybe we can go to uh, Robert Malley that uh, Richard mentioned. So I end here with that. Thank you. Not very optimistic. <laughs> um, our next panelist, Vera Ameli. So now we're gonna look at the impact on Iran. She's a doctoral candidate at the Oxford University, Department of Social Policy and Intervention. 
She uses an interdisciplinary approach to study the political, structural, social, cultural, and institutional context of public health issues in Iran. Her research lies at the intersection of medical and social sciences and is currently focusing on access to treatment for people with HIV in Iran. Vera has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Brown University, a master's of science in biomedical sciences, as well as a master of public health from Boston University School of Medicine. Her work has been published in medical and scientific journal in addition to the New Left Review. Today, she will address the impact of sanctions on sustainable development goals and public health in Iran. Welcome, Vera. Thank you very much for that introduction and for including me in this panel. Um, I will follow those excellent um, foreign policy talks and sort of the somewhat both grim outlooks on things not likely to change substantially to sort of give a more, um, um, more of an overview of the internal um, impacts of these sanctions, but not just in terms of the harmful effects, also in terms of how Iran has been coping in this um, sort of isolated context. So I will first give an overview of um, United Nations development goals um, before moving on to uh, cover Iran's developments in isolation over the past 40 years, and then conclude with what I think would the long-term implications of it be. So um, upon the turn of the century, the world's um, heads of state signed at the United Nations General Assembly, one of the most, um, or arguably one of the most important um, international agreements in modern history um, in which they expressed an unparalleled uh, commitment to development in a millennium declaration. I quote from this declaration, which says, we will spare no effort to free our fellow men, women, and children from the abject and dehumanizing conditions of extreme poverty to which more than a billion of them are currently subjected. We are committed to making the right to development a reality for everyone and to freeing the entire human race from want. We resolve therefore to create an environment at the national and global levels alike, which is conducive to development and to the elimination of poverty. So recognizing the right to development was a first um, as sort of an international commitment at this level. Um, so this was undoubtedly a monumental occasion and it was shaped by visionary aspirations um, to commit to development collectively. And a series of eight concrete measures um, were defined and these were called the Millennium Development Goals. The cornerstone of these of course was the first objective which was to cut poverty and hunger in half by 2015. Um, and other vital objectives um, included to achieve uh, universal primary education, eliminate gender disparity in education, reduce child mortality by two thirds, reduce maternal mortality by three quarters and reverse the spread of HIV and malaria. Um, so from the outset, the newly launched um, Millennium Development Goals, which were supported by a um, um, quite a strong a PR machine, uh, prominently started to shape public imagination and remained high on the global policy agenda. And indeed it became the biggest coordinated international effort producing an energetic intellectual community of academics, experts, activists, and policymakers who were all committed to delivering the inalienable right to develop, dedicated to the promise of no one left behind. These efforts included developing and updating practice guidelines, building national and international infrastructures to collate and sum summarize progress measures, developing resources and courses for teaching and training students and practitioners of development, but above all, establishing large development funds dedicated to this booming now industry. These funds were to aid development, quote unquote. 
um, but countries were themselves responsible to meet these development targets. So establishing an assumption that poverty and all other aspects of development are predominantly determined through domestic policies. Rich countries could therefore only help in the form of financial and technical assistance in what became the aid industry. Largely, however, these funds were dispersed through institutions and expert communities in the global north to carry out projects within the global south, thereby in a classic neocolonial fashion, rewarding the institutions and leaders of the Western developed world for, the West, for, for what was presented as gains by the underdeveloped or developing world. Nevertheless, um, putting the critical um, looks aside, such commitments made at a global level were a testament to the interconnectedness, interconnected capacities for accelerating development. Moreover, such a collective path signified our shared vulnerabilities across borders, the various susceptibility and vulnerabilities that are currently laid bare, epidemiologically speaking, by the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and decades of enthusiastic funding, funding and joint efforts did indeed produce significant successes for development. A chief accomplishment was reported as having of global poverty by 2015, despite critics pointing out the imperfect measurement of who counts as poor, which was um, um, largely inadequate. Reversals of um, HIV and malaria transmission and reductions in maternal and child mortality were also largely realized. These achievements then created further momentum to establish what is now sustainable development goals with broader aims outlined in 17 total goals. And this set commits more assertively to eradicating poverty and hunger by 2030, while additionally considering ecological sustainability as well as human needs. Um, so in the, within the past two decades of the Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goal paradigms, Iran has remained isolated from the global sphere of collaborative development and has largely achieved the outline targets independently. And indeed, over the past four decades, since the inception of the Islamic Republic, as was very clearly elaborated, the country faced an ever-growing isolation from foreign supply of goods and resources and has had to develop without aid and without the realization of its full capacity for trade. So since the 1980s, amidst the eight-year war with the obdurate Saddam Hussein, which as it was mentioned back by Western powers and the Soviet Union, access to foreign drugs and medical equipment became a major threat to national health and well-being of Iranians. As a result, the newly established revolutionary state was reaffirmed in its perceived need for hyper-independence, expanding the state's understanding of autonomy to include medical and economic independence in addition to the traditional notion of state so sovereignty. So today, self-sufficiency and non-reliance on foreign support propagated under the discourse of resistance economy, are the essence of the Islamic, Republic, Islamic Republic's development worldview. The prism through which Iran's healthcare and welfare systems can also be unpicked as it has been uncoiling under one of the toughest sanctions regimes in history. Again, as, as um, Professor Fires Manish just elaborated. So the development of Iran's health sector under four decades of sanctions has benefited primarily from massive internal resource and political prioritization, something that gets less coverage um, uh, in the media sphere on Iran. The health system has adopted to basically pivot on efficient use of limited use of resource, limited resources and growing medical self-sufficiency as the country's largest expansion of health and social services occurred in the 1980s during a decade of political instability, war, isolation, and economic crisis. So despite the rapid fall of GDP during war years, a clear commitment to human development was made to create capacity within the previously unreached rural segments of the population. So contrary to the MDG and SDG paradigms of increasing growth for development, 
The Islamic Republic managed to produce one of the few examples of development that was independent from growth and instead relied heavily on community building and structural transformations. So amidst declining GDP in 1984, a, net, a network of community health workers formed the backbone of the nascent system of primary health care centers to de de deliver health education and preventative care. However, these, this PHC um, model um, was unique in that health interventions were identified locally rather than emulated through international best practice models. And by creating communities of practice with shared norms and religious beliefs and internal cohesion, uh, local practices based on local observed successes were more readily adopted. The result of this native style of development was massive improvements in all non-income measures of development, despite declining GDP, again, in war years. So there are a number of examples um, uh, on this, and I will just give an overview of some of the important measures, because oftentimes when saying anything positive about Iran, you need more rigorous evidence to sort of prove that. Um, so infant mortality, which is the most immediate indicator of public health success, dropped rapidly in war years. Not only equal to or better than other Middle Eastern nations in the back of the country, but also better than the average performance of middle income countries as a whole. Um, life expectancy was falling in this field prior to the revolution during the period of the We're so, losing your voice, Vera. Maybe I should uh, turn off your video. Is my voice more clear now? Yes. Okay. Um, so life expectancy, which was falling in the two years prior to the revolution during a period of economic growth began to rise in 1985, 1984, despite continued war sanctions and falling GDP. And this was a result of the expansion of access to health and social services for previously unreached communities. And another notable achievement of the primary healthcare model is near universal co coverage of measles vaccination, which is quite relevant today, and the reduction in maternal mortality rates from 91 cases per 100,000 births, um, which, was, which has been the most substantial reduction that has been seen in history. Um, and remarkably, the fastest reduction in fertility also um, of recorded history was observed from an average of six children to three children per mother. So this was a direct result of deviation from international approach to family planning, which was based on the idea of an unmet demand for contraceptives. However, in many states, either the results that achieved were poor, such as Bangladesh, or governments ended up appealing to harsh and authoritarian policies to force the fertility rate down, such as India and China. Iran, however, delivered family planning primarily through com community-driven models by recognizing that the main driver of reduced pregnancies would be empowerment of women and changing social norms with regards to participation of women in higher education and the workforce, which then mushroomed following the Islamic revolution to the present day in which women make up 67% of the science and technology students and more than half of total university students. So it is not surprising then that during the MDG or Millennium Development Goal implementation, Iran had its independent infrastructure to achieve most outline goals, despite the continued global isolation and pressure from sanctions. And poverty rates halved, as it was the goal, the, the primary goal of Millennium Development Goal, well below the global measurement of who counts as poor, since proportion of population living on less than one dollar per day were the goal to have that popu to, to have that population. And in Iran, that fell from 0.9 percent to 0.2 percent by 2005, so 10 years before the end of the Millennium Development Goals. And so did the proportion of people living on two dollar per day, which significantly decreased from about seven percent to three percent. So Iran's human development potentials that made massive strides during war years and onwards are now the find foundation of an expanding service industry such as health and medical sector with approximately 150,000 physicians that are right now fighting the, in, in the front line against coronavirus. 
The young but educated population are the country's most valuable resource now. And the primary reason why, as Professor Fayez Manish mentioned, the economy is still not in a state of collapse because even though Iran has an oil-based economy, but it also has grown in its service uh, industry, industry sector. And, and um, this service industry sector also supports the nexus of medical education and population health today. And these two pillars are integrated under the mandate, mandate of Ministry of Health and Medical Education System, which is quite unique in Iran that it combines these two ministries together to ensure that the medical universities are um, training cater, medical caters based on local demands and also um, are delivering universal quality of care across Iran, decentralized and universal quality of care. Um, and over the last two decades, um, recognizing the need again as uh, the need for increasing health sec security through self-sufficiency, the domestic health and medical sector expanded both in terms of coverage and market size. And the national development plans that are revised every five years um, provide a policy framework to enhance this resilience in the health sector. And the main policy aims are to move towards universal health coverage and to create a medical innovation ecosystem that can drive self-sufficiency. But of course, all of this has been under extreme pressure as purchasing power has reduced and it has been more and more difficult to deliver universal health care. Um, however, strict supply and demand regulations are in place inside the country, um, which if Iran, uh, this is probably a silver lining of Iran's isolation, because if ascension to the World Trade Organization um, occurs, Iran would probably be forced to let go of its support for, for import substitutions by wall of tariffs. Um, and I could go in more detail with how on the supply and demand side, these um, policies are having an impact to sort of drive forward medical innovation. Um, but I will leave that for the discussion in case anyone wants to know more detailed information. Um, but it suffices to say that the infrastructure that has been developed has um, particularly strengthened Iran in, in the areas of biotechnology and pharmaceuticals. And the country is um, sort of self-sufficient by dosage for more than 90% of the medication that it needs. But that is equivalent to only 67% of actual active uh, pharmaceutical ingredients, which means that sanctions um, have been reducing access to those critical medications that Iran may, not a large segment of the population may need them, but critical cases do need them. And these include children and cancer patients. Um, so, um, so uh, to conclude, I'd like to say that despite all this progress, the economic strangulation of the country palpably um, has slowed progress. And the unilateral sanctions imposed by the four years of Trump presidency, as just now uh, very nicely covered, were not unique in the history of Iran's development, but Trump's maximum pressure policy perhaps most directly and most strongly, strongly struck Iran's development with damages that are not easily reversible, of course. For example, by indiscriminately blocking financial transactions, regional collaborations were severed, preventing Iran and its neighbor to build on their joint capacities. And most importantly, of course, during a pandemic, sanctions threatened the health of ordinary Iranians further by causing the diminution of essential medical and pharmaceutical trade and interruption of local supply chains even, where locally produced medications and equipment rely on imports. So if the Millennium and Sustainable Development Goals are not sufficient commitments for global cooperation and inclusion of Iran, the coronavirus pandemic must have taught us an epidemiological lesson on the extent of our interlinked vulnerabilities to which we are exposed. Iran is commonly portrayed on one hand as being on the verge of collapse under sanctions and on the other crumbling under government mismanagement. Neither is a complete picture. 
And undoubtedly, sanctions and mismanagement both have a deleterious effect on the potential capacity and trajectory of the country. However, while mismanagement and corruption must be confronted within Iran's borders, the legacy of sanctions, its tremendous human cost during a global pandemic, and the decades of Iranian isolation from the Global Development Club will create a tinted picture of international solidarity, fueling mistrust and complicating future co cooperation and diplomacy. After three decades from the bitter legacy of international complacency in the use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein against Iranians, the United Nations and the global community of activists and development practitioners must be more proactive in their condemnation of the political interest, namely the United States, that is taking Iran's development hostage. Thank you, Helia. <laughs> Thank you, um, Vera. This was fantastic. So we're going to move. We have about um, 25 minutes for question and answer. Um, Helia is going to take it over. And uh, please use chat for questions or Helia may want to call on um, our, uh, our participants. Thank you so much, Vida John. Um, well, thanks everyone. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for this thought provoking discussion. Um, and a good afternoon from uh, what's known as Ottawa, the unceded territories of Algonquin Nation. Uh, my name is Helia. I'm a PhD candidate in law and legal studies at Carleton University. And I'm very happy to be facilitating uh, the Q&A session today with the delay and uh, being mindful of the time zones of our speakers from Turkey and Iran. Uh, we're gonna have a rather short session and I encourage everyone to use the chat box. Um, we are also keeping an eye on the Facebook, if you're joining us from Facebook, on the Facebook chat as well. So you can, uh, you can write your questions there too. So um, let's get into it. I have the first question from Masoud Shadman. And the question is, uh, the nuclear agreement was something that Iran could accept because Iran time and again emphasized that they're not after nuclear weapons. So Iran could say that they're, they're ready to take some steps to give more confidence to any states in the world in that regard. But the issue of Palestine, Syria, Yemen, as well as their defensive missile programs are issues that are tied with Iranian identity and independence. And so Iran will never compromise on those fronts. So my question is the following, what cards Iran has to play with? Uh, is there a way for Iranian government to make Biden distance his government from Israel? Um, do I have a volunteer from, from our speakers for this question? Well, maybe I can uh, say a few words about that. I, th I think it's very unrealistic to think that Iran can exercise any leverage over the Biden administration with regard to the Middle East uh, generally. I think it might be able to uh, create a situation where it uh, returns to the uh, uh, JCPOA agreement in ways that give Biden a big diplomatic victory uh, it will make him look very good to do something that so uh, thoroughly pleases the Europeans and uh, refute, refutes the approach taken by Trump. But whether there'll be side benefits in terms of greater tolerance for Iranian pursuit of their uh, legitimate engagement in regional conflicts, I'm very doubtful about. I think that's the US is a geopolitical actor that doesn't play by the rules of reciprocity and equality. It does what it tries to preclude others from doing. Those double standards are so deeply embedded in the way the world is organized and play out particularly in the Middle East. In other words, 
uh, the U.S. can intervene at its discretion throughout the region, but any other not country that isn't allied with the U.S. and tries to do the same thing will be castigated as terrorist and violator of international law and the like. And so this sense that uh, Iran must either suffer this kind of continuing uh, hostility that Sassen has outlined from uh, day one of their of the revolution, uh, while uh, U.S. and Israel can really use force at will in the region is one of the moral scandals of international political life at the present time. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Falk. Do I have anyone else from the speakers who would like to speak on this before I move on? Uh, uh, their question was, uh, what card does Iran have to play uh, in Middle East when it comes to some issues such as Palestine, and uh, which has become, as uh, the individual mentioned, an identity of Iran basically is tied to that issue. And I would say that they really don't have much card to play there. Uh, it's impossible. Um, if the intention is from the very beginning regime change in Iran, and if that continues, um, nothing would be resolved. You just just go over this issue of nuclear agreement and all the other problems would re remain. So I don't think they really have much of a card to play. The only card that Iran has to play uh, is uh, how much ura uranium they can enrich and to what degree. And they're using that uh, to reduce sanctions. So uh, I'm not very optimistic that they have any card to play in the, in the Middle East right now. All right, thank you. Um, so I have a question from Marwa al Nasser, And the question is, when discussing no war with Iran, uh, how should we best respond to the people who bring up Iran's own government problems and want regime change? Richard, you want to take that? Okay, I can say a few words. Uh, I, I think Iran's uh, prob internal problems, including human rights and other related problems are serious but they're basically within the uh, context of Iran's uh, play of internal forces. In other words, it's not for uh, the outside world to interfere in ways that are uh, coercive, which is what it's been doing. Human rights and uh, anti-democratic behavior by the Iranian government has been used as a pretext uh, for this coercive diplomacy that we've been discussing. Uh, and so I see the issue as one of self-determination by the Iranian people with respect to the internal problems and the right of a sovereign Iran to be free from uh, external intervention as the foreign policy challenge. So that there is no justification for keeping the sanctions or for the aggressive uh, hostility toward Iran that has been a consistent feature of American policy since 1979. Uh, there's no no justification in law or morality for that. It's a pure geopolitical power play, and it's justified in part by this fear of political Islam at the beginning, a uh, 
a subservience to Israeli uh, security and regional ambitions. Uh, there are many factors that have played into this, but the basic point, I think, is sovereignty means uh, non-aggression toward Iran, and it's up to the Iranian people to create the conditions for democratization and human rights within their own country. Thank you for that. Can I say something too? Absolutely, please go ahead. Yep, uh, over the weekend I had a piece in Counterpunch. It was quite sarcastic. And nevertheless, uh, uh, I gave President Biden a blueprint for Iran, how to do regime change. Um, if you want to see change in Iran, including human rights violation, which is real, and it's a problem. If you want to see change in Iran, leave it to itself. Stop doing what you are doing. Stop the sanctions, stop the murder, stop the killing, stop the ch chase, stop threats and all that. Stop it, leave it to itself. Iranians have a very long history of fighting despotism. And if they are left on, this, on, them, uh, on their own, and there are no enemies at the gate, they will take care of the problems themselves. So I, I, I just leave it at that. There is a problem in Iran. There is the problem of violation of civil liberties and human rights. But there are worse problems in Saudi Arabia. They dismem dismember a journalist. It's horrific. Nevertheless, Saudi Arabia is a kingdom and Iran is a regime. So we can't really go by what U.S. says that that's irrelevant. Thank you. Let's stop. All right. Thank you. Um, this, um, absolutely. Very John. And so I just being in Iran and also I think I saw one of the comments about my talk that basically mentioned that this description of the Iranian economy ignores the internal issues of privatization and um, um, corruption. And um, again, like as um, Professor Falk and Professor Freisman mentioned, I think that all of the issues and in my mind being in Iran, I think corruption and the economic problems are more forefront in people's um, lives and um, um, desires. It's only internationally that um, some of the human rights cases are um, portrayed on a, um, under a stronger light. But um, I do think that these are uh, fights to be fought within Iran. And um, unfortunately, any um, movement these days that happens internally in countries, it's sort of hijacked by imperialism. And I think as Iranians, um, especially if the question came from someone who is themselves Iranian and from someone who is inside Iran right now, I do believe that we need to make sure that our um, sort of calls for change are not going to be usurped by, um, by the imperialist agendas. And that um, there are uh, optimism uh, in terms of things changing, for example, in terms of corruption and um, privatization, there is a group called Justice Seekers or Edolat Khahan in Iran that are working very strongly on these issues, though these never get international recognition. But I think that this is the type of um, sort of movement and energy that is needed more than um, sort of talk of regime change and, and speaking and, and asking for things that basically is what the US wants, not the average Iranian. Thanks for that. Um, I'll, I'll go to Yasmin. Um, the slogan nuclear uh, free, free, the slogan nuclear free Middle East might be idealistic, but don't you think anti-imperialist must propose it as the only solution to the current situation. I guess since I brought that up, uh, I should uh, at least uh, start the responses to it. Uh, yes, I think not only anti-imperialist, but anyone that is concerned genuinely with the non-proliferation goals of arms control and disarmament 
should oppose uh, creating a kind of uh, exception for Israel as a nuclear weapon state in the region. And there's every reason for, uh, every reason except this subservience to Israel that US national interests would be much promoted by a denuclearized uh, Middle East. And it seems like a uh, the only reasonable solution except for the primacy of geopolitics. And the primacy of geopolitics means that you can't, that the US is handicapped from uh, or inhibited decisively from challenging uh, Israel's nuclear capability that it more or less facilitated in achieving. On the one side, uh, Sassen just mentioned the uh, discrepancy between tolerating terrible human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia and complaining uh, self-righteously about them in Iran. Well, the same thing is true for uh, the nuclear issue. We, we're completely silent about uh, Israel's uh, nuclear arsenal, even going along with this uh, fict fictitious uh, posture of neither admitting nor denying the existence of the arsenal, which everybody in the that's knowledgeable about these security issues is quite aware of its existence, and at the same time, uh, being willing to go to war against Iran if it pursues its own security interests in the manner that it sees fit. In other words, the geopolitical primacy means total double standards when it comes to uh, addressing the issue of proliferation in the Middle East. And a nuclear free zone would be a contrary commitment to equality and reciprocity. And that's the way international society should be organized. It should be organized on the basis of equality of rights and duties, not on the basis of hierarchy and double standards. If I may add one short comment. Absolutely. Uh, uh, it is not just nuclear non-proliferation in Middle East. It should be for everybody in the world who is involved in making uh, nuclear weapons. As of the time being, if I'm not mistaken, US has over 6,000 nuclear warheads in this country. And that is contrary to MPT. So we should be fighting against the uh, violation of uh, NPT by countries such as the United States and England and France and Russia and China and Pakistan and India and Israel. We should be fighting over those issues as well. I know it's unrealistic, but uh, that is part of the hypocrisy also. You know, they are, they are talking about Iran building nuclear weapons, even though they themselves in the US, they are in violation of NPT right now. So that's part of the hypocrisy. I stop. Thanks for that. Uh, Virajan, do I have you for this question or? Okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna move to the next session. I'm also gonna ask everyone to type their questions please, um, because we have a lot of questions. There doesn't seem to be much time left, but I'm going to try. Um, OK, so Xi Jinping recently warned of the threat of a new Cold War given the US's aggression. China also sanctioned uh, Pompeo and other figures from the Trump government very soon after Biden came to power. What role do you see China and Russia playing in the region in the next four years? Will both countries shift their strategies to cope with the new presidency in the US? This is, a this is especially relevant 
um, given that the Biden government seems to be uh, strengthening with Taiwan, much like the Trump government, which seems to be indicated uh, to indicate that Biden will not take a qu uh, qualitatively different position on China. Well, I can say something about this in response, though the question is sort of outside the scope of uh, our panel to a great degree. Uh, I think that um, Blinken, the new Secretary of State, made it very clear that he agreed with Trump's approach to China. And I think the danger of a new Cold War, a new geopolitical confrontation is very great because the US will want to show that it is a, a global leader again. And the best way to show it under current conditions is to take a tough line with China and Russia. And uh, the, it's a very risky policy. And it's particularly risky because the real Chinese challenge is technological and economic. And the only capability that the US has to project its capabilities is military. And so it could easily stumble into an unwanted uh, military confrontation with China or Russia with potentially disastrous results. And the implications for the Middle East are that uh, the Iran and other countries will turn to China uh, for uh, some of its uh, uh, economic uh, needs. And that this will, of course, play into the right wing in the US and the nostalgia uh, that exists for a cold, new Cold War. There's a bi bipartisan consensus that it's a good idea to revive uh, this kind of geopolitical confrontation, which keeps up the uh, imperialist military budget, exaggerates security threats, and uh, goes back to the kind of outlook that was characteristic of the Cold War decades. Um, thank you for, in the interest of time, I'm just going to move to the next question. Um, so, uh, sorry for bringing EU into the game. Should Iran trust the approach from EU, especially Germany? What role could the EU play in? What I can answer, I can actually go back a little bit to the question, previous question. I couldn't answer the issue of uh, China and Russia's role in the Middle East, but uh, I can tell you something about Iran, watching China and Russia and Iran. Um, they have their own games. Uh, they have played quite a bit of uh, manipulations and games with Iran. Uh, as I said, US managed to get their agreement on the Security Council to sanction Iran. How did they do that? I said, cajoling and bribing. What do you do? Well, you tell China, forget about the currency manipulation that we had, and then you sanction Iran. And they did. To Russia, what can you say? You say, okay, uh, in exchange for us, US, removing the missiles from Poland, you sanction Iran, and they do. So um, these countries play their own game, especially the EU3. Um, and uh, they have been playing it throughout the uh, Trump administration, and they will continue to play it in the Biden administration as well. Um, I wouldn't really trust uh, any one of these countries. Um all right, so we have a few more minutes and I have two final questions that I'd like to, to ask. Um, I'm gonna try to combine them, but we can also like discuss them separately. 
Uh, from Inai have what parallels do you see in the downfall of Libya compared to the continued existence of a free Iran? Often I worry, especially after seeing the Bolivian coup, that this would be the next target bearing all out war on China. Do I have anyone? I don't even understand the question. I'm sorry. Uh, would you like me to repeat that or we can? Yes, it wasn't clear the question, I think. I, I think maybe you can combine them, give both questions because we have only three minutes you left. Have? Sure, sure, absolutely. So uh, the next question would be, what is the impact of the Abraham Accord on Iran? Richard should take that one. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I think it's, uh, hard to say at the moment if it has any impact. It may, uh, depending on how the Israeli elections come out in March, make Israel a little bit more self-confident in the region, a little less hostile and toward Iran. Uh, but I think it is not likely to be an important uh, element in the uh, future and the, it doesn't really bear on what we've been discussing uh, during the panel. Thank you all so much for this. I'm gonna leave it at this and um, give the floor back to Vida John. Uh, thank you all again so much for the great question, for the great discussion. Uh, it was an honor to be facilitating this session. Vida John, all yours. Thank you. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I distinguished panelists and uh, our participants. And I want to invite you to our next uh, panel upcoming in March titled Iran and Palestine, a history of joint struggle. It will be in commemoration of Palestine Land Day, which is March 30th. Um, I just want to close with one of Kasi's founding principles, which says, we are committed to practicing a politics of the here and now. In order to transform the world, we must contend with it as it is where we are. As those located within the heart of US imperialism, which we used to call the belly of the beast, we have a responsibility to oppose it so that the peoples of the world build their own societies free from the terror of imperial violence. Again, thank you, Professor Falk, Sasan, and Vera for your insightful um, presentations. And thank you everyone for joining us and the, the panel will be on our website, on Cassie's website, and also on East is a podcast. So you can see the whole thing there. Thanks. Good. Take care. Good to be with you.